So you know what? It's an honour because I actually pay quite a lot of attention to what you do, Brad. Um, so it's great to finally be here. Dude, well, I, I would say the same. I mean, obviously, I'm paying attention to everything you're doing. So it's an honour having you on the show. I greatly appreciate your time. Paul, before we talk all things 16 again, and before we get to know you a little better, I've got a very important question for you. Go ahead. Do you know exactly how many underscores you have in your Instagram handle? (laughs) (laughs) You know what? It bugs me to this day. But like, it's one of those things that I don't know what I was thinking. I remember the day I set it up, actually, and I don't know what I was thinking. But now it annoys me so much, honestly. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because it's probably going to force me to actually handle it. But yeah, it's so annoying. Man. <laughs> well, just to give you the heads up, it is 13. And thank God it's an odd number. I don't know if you have like a personal preference, but my OCD, I have to have odd numbers. So, oh, really? Yeah. So, oh, well, yeah, if so. if it was an even number, I probably wouldn't even be doing this chat right now. <laughs> well, yeah, we would we wouldn't be here this at this moment, would we? No, <laughs> Paul Wolford, welcome to America's Dance Thirty. Thank you so much, Brian. It is great finally meeting you and chatting. Congratulations on sixteen again, going number one. That is so incredible. Thanks so much. I'm so pleased. Like I, and I know, I know how many K and Lewis are as well. We're all so pleased about this. So thank you so much. Now, is this your first number one or your second? I don't remember if promises. Or... This is this is actually my third. Um, oh, <laughs> because I think because many, yeah, the 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 actual the last one I had, well, it was it was a remix, uh, but she didn't mention me. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I did a remix for um, Joy Crook's Feet Don't Fail Me Now. I did the remix, and, and the remix made this number one spot. And then the previous one was on my collaboration with Diplo and Kareen Lomax um, uh, called Looking For Me, and that was in 2020. So ancient history on that one, <laughs> and a re- more recent history on the Joy Crooks. But, yeah, I, Joy did her interview, and I was like, oh, yeah, she's going to mention me. She's going to mention and me. she and never like, mentioned <laughs> Like tapping my feet. (laughs) But anyway, we're here. It's so funny you mentioned that because I remember doing the interview with Joy Crooks and her talking about how she wasn't really that into remixes. So yeah, she wasn't. Yeah, she was saying that. I was like, oh, you like it now, don't you? (laughs) Because to be honest, between me and you, Paul Wolford, that's the only reason it went number one is because it had your remix. Well, you know, it was a great song. I, I love the song, but I, I couldn't possibly take all that credit. But yeah, big up Joy. Absolutely. <laughs> she is so talented. Well, I was She's reading amazing. your IG mm. post from back in March when 16 Again dropped and mm. the backstory with a lot of the writing of it. So I'm really interested to hear how this song was born. But before we yeah. talk all about that, let's get to know Paul Wolford a little better with Finky's Firsts. Of course, yeah. I always love finding out the origin story of artists. I know when you were younger, you were working at a record shop, right? That's right, yeah. Was music the first thing you wanted to do when you grew up, or was there something else you wanted to be? Well, music had been constant, but I, I actually I actually went, I studied art, so I went to... Um, I went to Leeds College of Art and Design, which is where I live, Leeds in the north of England, for those that don't know. Um, it's about one hour from Manchester. And yeah, I, I studied art. So that was that was what I was doing. And then while I was, you know, while I was studying, I, I basically I was spending all my time in clubs and buying records and, you know, and all the rest of it. But but yeah, the, the radio had always been on in, in you know, my, at my parents' house. So yeah, I was just surrounded by music my, my whole life, really, you know. That's so incredible that it actually turned into such an amazing career. Now, I, I yeah. know later this month you're going to be playing New York City. Uh, I think next month you're going to be right. back in Ibiza. Do you remember yeah. the first show you ever did? I think the, the first one that I did, I think it was in a 
I think it was in a it it was in like a um <laughs> is that it was called a horticultural uh, society, which is basically it's a it's a building where um people that are really into like plants, plants. They, they yeah. sort of gather, <laughs> yeah. And and what had happened was a friend of mine, it was his birthday party and, and he'd um, he'd hired this hall, this horticultural society hall, and he had all his friends there and he um basically he had some turntables and it was all vinyl. And, and I remember playing there, and it was it was actually quite good. It was quite a good gig. Um, it was, but it was insane, you know, because I mean, you know, the the culture of um, you know teenage culture in the UK is so extreme. Like like kids like drink as teenagers are crazy. So um, it was pretty, you know, it was a bit spicy. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was the first one, and and they were cut the first. I'd say the first five to ten were all like those types of things, you know, like friends parties and all of this type of thing. So, you know, it's a, it was a baptism of fire. That's that's how we'll describe it. <laughs> I love that you use the word spicy because me and my best friends use the word spicy when we're talking about getting trashed off tequila and gummies. So <laughs> I love yeah. that you say Yeah, well, that. yeah, I could talk to you about that as well. But, you know, <laughs> let's stay on, on topic. On topic. <laughs> so we were just talking about your remix for Joy Crooks, of course, your songs yeah. with Diplo and Kareen Lomax and 16 Again, your latest number one. But do you remember the first song you ever produced? I do, actually. And it was and it was crazy because um, I mean, I, I'd been all, all throughout my teenage years, I'd been sort of collected, you know, bits of secondhand equipment. I was buying stuff from, a, there was a shop in Leeds called Big Deal, so you could buy drum machines you know, really cheaply. So I was doing like paper rounds and saving up for, for things. And, and then um, I was making these sort of little experiments, but I, to me, they weren't, they weren't tracks, they weren't records. And then um, as, as I got a little bit older, I, I think, I, I think I was, I was about 17. And when I was 17, um, I actually went in a, a hired, um, uh, like it was like a bedroom studio. It was actually in Headingley, which is only about 15 minutes from where I am now. And um, and the guy Jamie is called, and he 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 engineered and he showed me how to how to make a track properly because up to that point it was just like you know these little Casio keyboards and, and little drum machines and I was I was trying I didn't know what I was doing, um, and then when I went in with Jamie, the first day we made this track and you know the mad thing is I'd love to hear it now because I, at the time I mean I was I was obviously it was real it was a mess. But it was actually it was actually kind of good, and, <laughs> and then it was like I'll I'll try and describe it to you. It was a 150 BPM techno track, <laughs> which bizarrely these days that stuff's come back in vogue. But, right. You know, at the t- at the time it was very kind of like obscure, and um, and the and it was created for a la- it was actually for a label, a techno label in the UK called Blue Bay Seek, and um and Tantra, who was the A and R, she actually pressed, she got a, a dub plate made up, so. The first track that I made in a proper, a proper, well, you know, raw studio, but but ne- nevertheless done properly was actually I had a, I had like a, an acetate of it, which is crazy, like and, and it and it blew, it blows my mind even to this day that that happened. It's really wild. And then the, of course, the record company folded before Aww. it could be released. So, <laughs> so I was at all my hopes and dreams of folded up and <laughs> thrown in the dustbin. But I learned a lesson and the lesson was resilience, you know. So we need to, you know, you can't put all your hopes and dreams into one thing. You have to, you know, have a more realistic sort of outlook. So so I learned a lot about how to how to produce and um, and I took it from there. And, and, it, and it was slow process over the years. But yeah, that was that was the first thing, and then and then the first thing that was released. I was twenty one by by the time uh, the first thing was released. But of course, when you're that age, four years between seventeen and twenty one feels like forty years. It's it feels like you know <laughs> such a huge amount of time. Whereas these days, I'm like you know, four it's gone so far. Yeah, like, feels like four nanoseconds. You know what I mean? <laughs> four years is like done like that. I but feel yeah, like we've yeah, been talking done. for four years. That's how quick it goes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 40. So what stops you from going back and revisiting that song? Um, actually, well, it's funny because as I was talking to you then in the back of my mind, I was thinking you need to pull that thing out, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's um, I, you know what? And I've got a very, very, I can, I can, I can hear the whole thing now. 
I can hear the whole thing. And that is that's kind of because, you know, I, I've lost the count of the amount, the amount of tracks I made over the years. I mean, it's it's in the thousands of, you know, there's only I've only ever I've never released. If I released all of it, it, it would be a disaster. But um, <laughs> I've only ever released kind of maybe 20 percent of what I've made. Um, but that particular track, I can I can remember exactly what was what it consisted of, whereas there's thousands more that I've got no idea. I just can't remember doing them. That is so incredible. So, well, hopefully, mad. knock yeah. on wood, we'll all be able to hear it very soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. You might get a headache, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll move on from that then. Of yeah. course, uh, very recently, you were nominated for a Grammy. Uh, do you remember when the first time you found out that you were nominated? <laughs> yeah, you know what? This is it's, this is a, such a crazy. This is a crazy moment. It was I had no idea I was nominated, and then I was working away in the studio, and then I thought I'll have a little break. I look at Twitter, started scrolling through some tweets, and it came to the Academy, and they saying, "Oh, you know, live Grammy nominations in five minutes," and I was like, oh, "Okay." <laughs> I'll have a look. And I made a cup of tea. I went into the room next door. I sat on the sofa and I'm drinking my tea and I'm listening to it. And, I'm, you know, the categories, because it's so, like, there's so many categories, there's so many names. And, and I watched a bit of it. And then I turned it off. <laughs> and, then I, and then I thought, and for some reason, I've got no idea why, something made me bring it up again. I went back onto Twitter and I was like, oh, yeah, let me find it. And I started looking again. And then it got to the category, which was um, best remix, best remix recording. And, um, and and I just said, it was so strange, Brian. I just had this feeling. They said the first one. They said the second one. And I just, after, as soon as they started saying the second one, I was like, you're going to be nominated. I, I knew. It was no so strange. Crap. And then they said the third one. And then the fourth one and the fourth one was me. And, and um, when they said it, my, my my wife and my daughter are upstairs in the house, right? Okay, when they said it, I started screaming like a <laughs> teenage girl and running around the house. And I ran upstairs and my wife thought we were being burgled or something because I was screaming that much. She thought we were being attacked. And, uh, and I was so, I was just absolutely, I was so happy, so pleased. Um, I, and it was, you know, we we went to the to the Grammys. Obviously, we went. I didn't win. Purple Disco Machine won, but his, you know, r- rightly so. It was incredible what he did. He, he won with Lizzo. Uh, my nomination was for the Knox. My remix of the Knox. But it was an incredible experience. And um, and I also at the same time because Diplo's album was um, nominated for Best Electronic, and I did two of the songs on there. So I felt like it was a double. It was like a double uh, nomination by default on through through Diplo but um but yeah you know it was just such a great experience and and, and I actually joined the academy this week so so now I can vote <laughs> so yeah so I'm going to win next time. <laughs> since you're predicting everything once we hop off this chat if you can send me lotto numbers I would greatly appreciate absolutely. it absolutely <laughs> yeah I've got you covered <laughs> thank you Paul <laughs> now finally in Finky's first in honor of 16 again going number 1 if you could go back to when you were 16, what would be the first thing you would tell young Paul Wolford? I'd probably tell my, tell myself to not worry about what other people say so much. Amen. You know, you know I, I think I think that's one of those lessons that you only really learn with time. You know, I, I say it to my daughter quite quite often. You know, so you you know you could, there's obviously there's a healthy amount of concern for other other people's opinions, but but you know. By and large, when you put your head on the pillow at night, you, just, you know, those opinions mean nothing. So so you've got to just have a, you know, just take a step back. And, you know, I wish I'd, I wish I'd really, I mean, I mean, my dad always said that to me. My, both my parents said that to me, but I, I just didn't, you don't really take it on board, do you, at that age? No, but, not uh, at all. And yeah. and to be honest, I, I don't know how kids these days do it because yeah. obviously when we were 16, there wasn't all this social media and having to deal with all that stress over and above exactly. everything else. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't imagine either. I mean, those those types of pressures, we we simply didn't have that. It was 
it was a far more naive time, you know. And it was still stressful for us. <laughs> of course, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you, yeah, I mean, I don't know how they do it. Well, let's talk about good things. 16 again, going number one. I was reading the post from back in March, and there is definitely a history with the writing of this song. How was this born with Lewis Thompson and m and So first of all, I've got to say I feel so so honored that m and k is singing this song because he's incredible. Lewis is incredible as well. Lewis is a, you know, he's a hit machine. Um, but yeah, the, the song came out of a writing camp. So Lewis... Lewis set up a writing camp and I think I think they did like five or six days and there was different different groups of people there and punctual were there who were who were like a a writer producer combination that they're, they're amazing they're, they're, they're brilliant and also Robert Harvey was there who's another incredible songwriter and a bit of a hit machine as well so it's kind of a I mean really it's a bit of a dream team um those guys all of them they're all incredible at what they do and um and basically lewis lewis was he, lewis was he, he was sending me songs because i was i was saying to him one night i was like hey, what have you got have you got anything really kind of that feels timeless and he was sending me demos and and and, and i was like yeah they're good but i know you've got something else and i, <laughs> I just pushed him and it, and, and sit the the rough demo of, the, of 16 again was the i think it was the the that no, was the sixth song that he sent wow. me. He sent me six songs, and on the sixth, I was like, "I, I know it. That's the one." And, and I think he must have been relieved because he was probably like, mm, "Come on, mate." He's like, "Leave me alone um, already." <laughs> yeah, but but when it came to it, we got into it, and then um, yeah, the process of refining, and then I sort of I added, added some components, and then we sort of you know we we got to work on it, and then and then it came about, and then and then it emerged, and I actually. My whole my whole view on it, I wanted it to be a, a bit heavier and a bit more clubbier. But to the, I mean, I, I think perhaps they were right. Um, M N E K, uh, Lewis, and also Punctual as well. They they all kind of vetoed me, sort of <laughs> taking it much harder because I think I think those guys, you know, they're just a lot more in tune with radio. Really, I mean, I love the radio as well, but I, I spend so much time in nightclubs because of DJing constantly. So. Um, I kind of wanted it to be a little bit heavier, but we 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 got to this we got to this sweet spot in between the two. Um, so yeah, it was, I mean it's an honour working with those guys, particularly M and E K. He's 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 incredible. I I absolutely love him. I think he's a he's a national treasure. You know, in in years to come, I I actually think I think in years to come he'll be like. In, in maybe 20 years, 15, 20 years, it'll be like Elton John. He really will be. He's, he's incredible. Yeah, it's it's not only incredible his songs that he's putting out, but he's behind so many songs that it's unbelievable. Right. His catalog is wild. And finding out Punctual was behind. I had no idea. Of course, Punctual's with yeah. Armin Van Buren. Punctual just released their own song, which is amazing. That's so that's right. incredible. Yeah, it's a real dream team. Yeah. How <laughs> long was the entire process from the writing camp to Ooh. when it finally got put out? I think, well, the writing camp, I think they had it. I think the writing camp might have been nine, mo- nine, nine months, maybe a year wow. previously. So Lewis had this thing. And he's got this demo. Sit. I mean, you know, God knows what else he's got, you know. <laughs> uh, but he had this demo. And he was like, oh, I don't know about this one. And I'm like, are you mad? You don't know. You don't know about this song. What? what? What's the world coming to? Sometimes you don't know what you have. It takes somebody else to say, actually, you know what? I can hear it. I, because we, as creators, you, you're in the studio. You're playing away. And, you know, you... you Yes, it's, it's it's a daily thing. Every day you're trying to create something and you try to pull something out of your mind. And then when you're so close, when you're this close to something, mate, you, you just can't see it. And, and it takes you to take a step back and somebody else can listen to something and go, actually, what about if we did that? And it's, you know, and, and, and here we are. Something I love <laughs> to find out is how many different versions there are from when you start <laughs> working on it. That, believe me, that's <laughs> another story. Because of all the dance floor versions, so uh, like, oh mate, I, that, I mean, you know, I do this every time with 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 records that are more like pop records. 
I probably there's like 50, 60, 70 versions. Oh my god! Uh, honestly, there is, and and ha- the the changes can be quite radical. So between say the ver- up to version thirty or forty, the the song will be quite similar, and then usually between thirty and thirty and forty, that's when it starts changing and getting more radical. And then the other the other people involved start going, "Oh, mate, you don't want to do that." <laughs> and then so between forty and fifty or forty and sixty, they they generally they get closer to the original in the process. There's always this middle part where I start going, oh, what about if we did this? <laughs> so who is the final person that says to you, all right, Paul, that's it. We need to put this <laughs> out. Well, you, you know, I mean, you know, how, how long is a piece of string? You know, <laughs> it's like, it can be, it can go. I mean, I mean, generally somebody puts, it's usually a collaborator that puts the foot down at some point. Um, and says, come on, mate. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes I'm the worst. Sometimes I'm like, no, we can, we should change that hi hat. Don't you think that hi hat there? Maybe you should take a little bit more bottom, a little bit more mid out of the hi hat. Just these silly things that are not going to matter in five years, 10 years, 15 years. But, but I think that's the thing. If you can feel like, if you get the song to the point where in your, with your actual physically with your it's like your your body t- I I always think that your body tells you um when when the song is right when it's this type of record because if you can get goosebumps and if you and in your mind in in, in yourself your whole body like I have to play this to I have to play this to my my nearest and dearest so if if you feel that your every fiber of your body wants to share it um then I think that's that's generally a good sign, and that's that's what you're looking for all the time, or that's what I look for. Um, you sort of you, your um, the the universe tells you, you know, with with whether it's your your body signaling it or or just you know you just have that gut feeling or whatever it is, but but generally. The universe tells you when to stop. I got to be honest. I wish my body told me when to stop a lot because normally, <laughs> normally, like I just keep tweaking and tweaking, and it is oh, so effing annoying being a perfectionist. <laughs> well, it's con- so easy to do that, <laughs> right? Well, congratulations you know? on sixteen again, going number one. That is so incredible. What is next for Paul Wolford? Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate it. I mean, what's next is just more of the same. I'm just in in a in a flow of collaborating. You know, I've got so many different records on the go with so many different people. I've got um, some stuff that's coming out on Peggy Goo's label, uh, which is a different project, and and loads of stuff. Just endless collaboration. You know, so more of the same. Hopefully, you know, I don't drive my collaborators up the wall too much. <laughs> Actually, hope you do so that we can have another number one. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, that's what we want, such wood. (laughs) Absolutely. Paul Wolford, congratulations on your third number one. Thank you for your time on America's Dance 30. Thank you, Brian. Sincerely appreciated and have a great day. 